Good evening. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you're able to join us for tonight's lecture, Photographing Kentucky Icons from the Ring to the River with C. Thomas Harden. Tom Harden spent 28 years at the Courier Journal, more than half as Director of Photography. Prior to that, he photographed for the Daily Courier Journal and Louisville Times as a staff photographer, and later for the Courier Journal's Sunday Magazine. He was the director when the photo staff was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of court-ordered busing in Louisville. It was the first time that a photo staff had been awarded the Pulitzer. He shared another Courier Journal Pulitzer awarded to the entire news operation. Another Pulitzer was awarded while he was director to a staff photographer and a reporter for localized coverage in Cambodia. Arden graduated from Center College and began his career at the Courier Journal and Louisville Times the next morning as an intern. He was hired as a staff photographer following his service in the U.S. Army. Regularly receiving awards for his photographs, he was named Southern Photographer of the Year. He was elected president of the National Press Photographers Association and awarded several of their honors, including its highest recognition, the Joseph Sprague Award. He has been president of the National Press Photographers Foundation for several years. The foundation awards almost 20 annual scholarships and grants to students and working photojournalists. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation. Please join me in welcoming C. Thomas Harden. Well, thanks very much, Patrick. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate a lot of the staff at the Filson, uh, including Julie and Patrick and Emma and Sarah, and especially Scott, uh, for all the help that he has given as well. Tonight, the tradition of journalism and excellence in Louisville was fostered by the Bingham ownership many years ago. That tradition of expecting good work extended well into the newspaper's photojournalism. That support made it possible for talented journalists and photojournalists to work at the Louisville newspapers and made it possible for me to make this pres presentation decades later. Tonight, we will visit a series of photo stories Documenting, documenting several icons of Kentucky, people, institutions, and events that have been important to Kentuckians and often in the US and even in the world. I have been privileged to be an observer, given the opportunity to be alongside people who were doing their everyday jobs, usually quite well. History in a visual sense, these photographs and the stories were made during the mid 1960s into the late 70s. Yes, the icons change from decade to decade, but some will never be forgotten. I joined the Courier Journal and Times photo department after an internship and a stint in the US Army. I was hired as a full-time staff photographer for the Courier Journal and the Louisville Times. Then, and a few years later, I was assigned to the Sunday Magazine as its staff photographer until 1975. And I was director of photography until er the early 1990s. The Sunday Magazine was part of the Curry Journal and Times Sunday newspaper. Some called it the Roto section since it was printed on Rotogravure presses. During that time, it averaged 40 to 60 pages per week. Yes, the Sunday Magazine was, was uh, published a lot of color, but tonight I've chosen almost all black and white photographs. And as odd as it seems today, almost all were shot on film, not digital. Digital didn't arrive until the mid 1990s at most newspapers when the first cameras were developed that produced high enough quality images for newspaper reproduction. But first, when you talk about icons in the 60s and 70s, especially around Louisville, one probably thinks of some of the icons in the arts community. During this period, the arts were hot around Louisville with large audiences, the creative spirits flourished, and even some new productions that were taken nationally, and several received prestigious awards. We were entertained by the Louisville Orchestra, 
and its conductor, Jorge Mester. He had two stints with the Louisville Orchestra. This photograph was from his first, or it might be Moritz Baumhardt of the Louisville Opera. He, many marveled over the years that he produced great opera productions in Louisville on a shoestring. Or it could be John Jacob Niles, Kentucky's balladeer. Here he is holding cards with the lyrics while singing one of his famous songs. He's become known as the Dean of American Balladeers. Go away from my window, I wonder as I wander. Or another one could be C. Douglas Ramey, Shakespeare in the Park in Louisville, both founder and director for many years. Shakespeare in the Park is now the oldest free Shakespeare Festival in the United States. Or the Louisville composer in residence, Philip Rhodes. Here are the two opening two pages that we presented this story in the Courier Journal Sunday Magazine. His new work was presented by the Louisville Orchestra. And one more from the emerging arts scene in the 1970s Louisville was John Jory, Actors Theater's producing director. Here he's rehearsing his first production in Louisville under Milkwood. Do you remember all those ladders on the stage? But tonight I will focus on Kentucky-based icons, citizens who became well-known for their efforts in and around Kentucky, and sometimes far beyond the state. These icons affected change in their quest to win, to assist the wounded, to entertain, or just to achieve. In the last decade or so, we have seen the well-documented historics, heroics, excuse me, by many of the nation's first responders, police, firefighters, healthcare workers, and many others in very visible situations. These jobs were often physically and emotionally wearing. Meet Paul Maynard, he's 26 and a Kentucky State Trooper. He was stationed near his boyhood home in Eastern Kentucky at State Police Post 9 in Pikeville. Trooper, Trooper Maynard received his second call of the morning. A car had left a single lane bridge overturned into a creek bed. Maynard arrived at the scene and finds the victim. The state trooper determines that death was probably instantaneous. He checks for evidence inside the car and asks someone to call a funeral home to send a car to transport the victim. He helps with others on the scene. For example, to carry the stretcher with the victim to the car sent by the funeral home. The trooper is at the rear of the stretcher. After loading the stretcher into the funeral home car, Maynard pauses a moment on this very hot and humid day. Then Maynard returns to the creek bed to look for evidence. The overturned car is in the background. After the onlookers leave, Trooper Maynard seeks details. He interviews the family who reported the accident to the state police. The site of the accident is on the left in the background. Most importantly, Maynard has to inform the victim's wife the widow's first news of the tragedy. Paul Maynard had been a state trooper for four years. This accident was his 10th fatal. He said at the time, quote, while investigating, I don't have much time to think about it. But later he said, it does bother me when it's all over. Some stories are done very quickly within a few hours, like Trooper Maynard, but others take a year or so. I wanted to see if I could find an Ohio River story, 
The river had been an important icon in Kentucky's history for hundreds of years. Its commerce and the ongoing life along the banks of, the Kentucky's, of Kentucky's border, from essentially Ashland in the east to Paducah, where it, the, where it joins the Mississippi. So Billy Davis, then director of photography and pilot of the newspaper's airplane, and I flew the river from Ashland to Evansville and found Slim Island to document the life cycle of that island. The story encompassed a number of visits during the year to photograph the changing island. What is Slim Island? Well, it's 600 acres. In Union County, Kentucky, it consists of a large abandoned house, an old barn, a storage shed, and a silo. This is the way the story appeared in the Sunday Magazine. You are looking at two pages in the CJ's Magazine. And the opening spread with words by Millie Hamilton, who was a Sunday Magazine copy editor, and they set the scene for describing the island. Quote, forlorn while dormant, bustling in the seasons of growth, fertile river islands like the one called Slim follow a distinctive life cycle from floods to harvest. Orphan earth of Union County, Kentucky and estranged from it, in an Ohio River bend downstream from Mount Vernon, Indiana. Slim Island is a 600 acre clod of rich farmland, heir to the legacies of time and the river. She continued about the island's life cycle. An abandoned home site awaits the smothering waters. Black treetops wreathe the drowned island. Yet the lingering fingers of ooze caress rather than choke, for the river steeps the land in nutrients and leaves a life-giving balm of silt. The next two pages she describes as, when the winter comes to Slim Island, it casts a chill, a still, ghostly pall upon the land, storage shed, Silo and empty house seem like lifeless river floats them. Silhouetted against the somber sky and the earth becomes a barren, wizened mud pie. But then there is new growth and Millie Hamilton continues. Time turns and earth's wanton site of renewal is structured into sowed ordered furrows to form jade chenille-like soybean tufts and vast green on green patterned fields of corn and nested on Slim Island are two fragile promises of wild and winged growth. I might add that the winged growth is the bird nest, the bottom of the page is rest that rested on the edge of the double hung window in the abandoned house. And finally comes the island's harvest. And Millie Hamilton concludes, come the season of fertition. The soybeans are fat with, record, with whiskered pods and the corn reaches for the sky. The largesse of time in the river and the good earth is gathered under an autumnal and sun and ferried across the water as a climbing jet plane cleaves the twilight. Coal mining has been a great icon of Kentucky, both in the eastern and western parts of the state. Great economic influences provided a way of life for generations of Kentucky citizens. Coal mine disasters, however, are often a cruel byproduct of coal mining, especially where deep mining occurs in the easternmost part of the state. Safety was sometimes a shortcut by the owners and operators in the deep mines in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky. 
where the Hyden mine disaster occurred. It was just after Christmas when it happened, December of 1970. The night of the Hurricane Creek mine explosion in Hyden, Kentucky. About a foot of new snow that night made the next few days more difficult for the families of the victims. Townspeople built fires for warmth, waiting to help in any way. Other miners describe what they know about the explosion and the retrieval of the bodies. 38 miners were brought out of the mine that night of the explosion. That first night, a local church hall became the gathering place for the miners' families. The man in the middle of the photo reads from a list seeking the family members of a particular minor, asking if they are in the room. At that moment, this moment, the widows are sure that their loved one was in the mine during the explosion and has died. Very early the next morning, having worked all night, another miner is found asleep in one of the buildings where the miners check out to go into the mine. Note the brass tags that each miner removes from the board when he goes into the mine. The blank spots on the board indicate that the miner didn't come out of the mine. Family members were brought into the high school gym to identify the bodies. The explosion was bad. A few miners could only be identified by their social security number on their belts. Later that morning, local citizens help a victim's relative down the snow covered steps of the gym after identifying their family member. The man on the left, as an aside, was the Courier Journal's bureau chief based in Hazard. David Hopp went on to become editor of the Courier Journal some years later. A terrific editor who never forgot the people of Eastern Kentucky. This is one of the 38 funerals. This one is for Lester Harris. Unfortunately, the making of a boyhood memory in a land where coal was king. In the Hyden Mine disaster, many families lost more than one relative. Since coal mining was a way of life, with good pay, many people worked in the mines. Some families, some families had more than one victim in this blast. Three families lost two relatives each, and three families lost three relatives each, and one family lost four members, all in that one explosion. explosion. Those family connections demonstrate how devastating the disaster was to a small community like Hyden, Kentucky. He was Kentucky governor in 1935, elected again in 1955 for a second term. He had been a Kentucky senator, state senator, a U.S. senator, a Kentucky lieutenant governor. He was Major League Baseball's second commissioner in 1963. A.B. Happy Chandler ran for a third term against Ned Brethett in the Democratic primary <clears throat> and lost. He tried again another run in 67 and lost. But that fever persisted. Happy Chandler still wanted that third term as governor. So in 1971, 
Chandler was running once again for that third term. But a lifelong Democrat, this time he ran as an independent candidate. His campaign staff included an RV driver and the RV, plus a couple of family members helping out as well. A spot or, a spot or two on TV, plus a bunch, a bunch of bumper stickers. That was pretty much his campaign, but he loved to campaign. He traveled the state into Eastern Kentucky to Cumberland, Kentucky in the rain, waving from his campaign RV. This is the second floor courtroom of the Knott County, Kentucky courthouse. Happy is perhaps thinking about all those previous courthouse rallies, sometimes at noon, sometimes at seven o'clock, sometimes two a day. They pretty much ended though soon after the 1963 governor's race. I hope you can see the happy campaign sticker on the courtroom ceiling fan. He called everyone Padna, unless he remembered your name. Howdy, Padna. And he went into Western Kentucky. These two men are from Scottsville. Seems to me to be two guaranteed votes for Happy. These are the crossroads at Keene, Kentucky, near Lexington. One basketball fan meets another. Chandler was a big UK Wildcats fan and he served on their board of trustees for many, many years. He found a random friend on Main Street in Henderson, Kentucky. Chandler was often quoted to say, to be a good politician, your word must be good. And you can't drink too much whiskey. Campaigning in the Bowling Green Billiard Parlor, Chandler was always wanting to shake as many hands as possible. Yet it seems that he is about to receive a lecture. And in a Lexington retirement home, in his, at his speech, he was talking about his Kentucky and about his memories and more memories. Happy has so many in the audience in tears. After the third party debate, Happy was standing on Frederick Street in Owensboro, across from the courthouse. Dusk was upon us. Three guys on motorcycles, one with a Captain America helmet came up and said, are you Happy Chandler? And he said, yes, Padna. And he said, well, we wanna tell you that we, we want, we're gonna vote for you. And he said, by the way, governor, do you have any bumper stickers? And he said, yes, over there in the RV. So the guys on motorcycles turned away. And as they got about four or five feet, the first guy turns around and says, happy, we just want to tell you, you got all your shit in one sock. Thank you, Padna, was his response and they went off over to the RV. And he turned to me and he says, what does that mean, Tom? And I said, I don't know, governor, but it sounded good. The light continues to come down in Owensboro. Happy waves to a passerby because there were no crowds, no advance work, only the RV across the street with the loudspeaker playing on on UK fight song and the often used democratic campaign song, Happy Days Are Here Again. It was played to nearly a vacant Frederick Street in Owensboro. Then the last Happy Chandler political speech of the 1971 governor's race on the front steps of the Rockcastle County, Kentucky courthouse on the Saturday before the election, 
It was also the last of thousands of Happy Chandler campaign and political speeches during his multi-decade career. <clears throat> On election night, his quest for a third term as governor was over. He and mama sit near the TV looking at early vote returns. He called mama his wife. Chandler received less than 20% of the vote as an independent. Democrat Wendell Ford won, Republican Tom Emerton lost, but it was not enough for A.B. Happy Chandler and his political career was over. <clears throat> Often called round ball, it came with a peach basket. Another Kentucky icon is basketball. Often in the, per, in the person of a University of Kentucky basketball coach, Adolph Rupp. While he had a couple of major issues during his coaching time, he coached at Kentucky from 1930 to 1972. Certainly Adolph Rupp has to be credited with generating some of the basketball fever in Kentucky. That fever extends to where some have played the game, even under difficult circumstances. Here's a small middle school in Western Kentucky shooting a jump shot over pipes in the boiler room. But few in Kentucky personify basketball as the man in the brown suit or the Baron of the Bluegrass, Coach Rupp at Kentucky. The first time I photographed Coach Rupp was in 1963. A Look Magazine photographer, a friend, called me while I was a senior in college in Danville. He needed an assistant during the game. I was on. But in later years, we have all seen photos of Kentucky teams at Memorial Coliseum and, of course, Coach Rupp. We've all seen him at a game, during a timeout, plotting, encouraging, but rarely cheering on his players, pushing his team, exhorting them, even though the game seemed well in hand. In this case, it was 85 to 71 with just six minutes to go. That was before the three point rule. A serious coach may be thinking, what's next? amid other players, coaches, and uh, players and coaches jubilation. Yet there were times that just the opposite, coaches, Coach Rupp in anguish while the players are stoic. Coach Rupp was well known for innovation. He used set offenses, establishing plays and their variations. The guard around offense was, was used early by Coach Rupp and the fast break. Rupp believed in repetitions, practice again and again, the set plays with their variations. But the fast break was one of the wild card, Wildcats hallmarks. Here, Dan Issel and Mike Pratt practiced the fast break over and over. During the practice of the fast break, Rupp didn't want the ball to hit the floor, only the sound of the sneakers. He was constantly teaching, perhaps the guard around offense. He used it early on. He was also an early adopter of the 1 3 1 defense and the zone defense, but he was a stern taskmaster. Note the rough evil eye in a one on one player conference during practice. practicing the jump ball at midcourt, but always watching and from what has to be the best seat in the house. Always pacing. I feel sure he knew every mark on his court. Didn't like Victor to walk on his floor with leather sole shoes. In the days before Nike's and New Balance, I was photographing practice. Coach Rupp came over and looked down at my rubber soled shoes. In his good Kansas twang, where did you get those shoes? 
coach, I brought him from home. I guess I passed. After practice to the Whirlpool, this is Thad Jarris in the Kentucky locker room. Later, Louis Dampier and Jarris get dressed. <clears throat> but after the games, under the seats in Memorial Coliseum, Rupp would meet with the reporters and do his radio show with Kay Wood Ledford. No fancy team backgrounds for TV. There was no TV just a sofa in a cramped space just below the seats. There were several named teams in Wildcat history, another aspect of Kentucky's basketball icons. This group is Rupp's Runts, who went on to the Final Four only to lose to Texas Western. Pictured here are Pat Riley, Larry Conley, Thad Jarris, Tommy Cron, and Louis Dampier. The man in the brown suit was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, among a number of other halls of fame. He played college basketball at the University of Kansas under legendary coach Fog Allen. John Naismith was an assistant coach under Allen. Naismith also invented basketball. Remember that peach basket? Naismith used it as its first goal. That's quite a trio on one team. Coaches Fog Allen and John Naismith and player Adolph Rupp. Rupp retired at 70, and that was the rule for University of Kentucky employees. His teams earned many national championships over the years, four from the NCAA, more from the NIT, and others of yesteryears. He was a five-time National Coach of the Year award winner and many firsts among his peers. Certainly the most important and best known and always highly entertaining, perhaps the best athlete in Kentucky history, Kentucky icon, Muhammad Ali. Can't you hear him now? The greatest of all time. Three generations of Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay as a Golden Glove boxer on the left. Then as champion the first time as Muhammad Ali in the middle. And then inside his Deer Lake training gym in a mirror, shadow boxing for the training for the Leon Spinks fight in New Orleans. He trained in the morning at dawn on one of the country roads near Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, running with his wife, Veronica, passing a cornfield. Ali felt he gained strength from the large boulders with names of boxing champions he respected. On these large rocks at Deer Lake, Floyd Patterson and Kid Gavilan. Inside the ring, headgear in place, and wall-to-wall -wall fans, Ali works with a sparring partner inside his Deer Lake Training Center. And at the punching bag. After a round of training, Louis Saria here on the right, hands care for the champ's pretty face. Saria cared for Ali during the boxer's entire career, working on his skin, his muscles, and in later years, his weight. Ali was very partial to those who were from Louisville. I really didn't have many conversations with him, just wanting to photograph what I observed. When I would arrive at a new assignment where Ali was, he would look up and he would, we would connect eyes and he would point a finger at me and, he, and I would mouth the word Louisville silently. And he would nod and then it was, it was fine from then on. He was always giving of his ac access to us over the years. After training, 
he was also so giving to his fans, always surrounded by dozens of eager admirers. Ali focuses on an individual child for a loving kiss. Note the Joe of Joe Lewis name on one of the boulders. A favorite for Lolly in the afternoon was performing and he also loved to perform magic tricks for the public who had come to Deer Lake. Look at those admiring faces. On a narrow country road with Ali is Dave Kindred in the car. CJ columnist at the time, sports columnist, a tense Dave Kindred describes the trip from the front seat. Quote, Ali steered with one hand while bouncing that big old boat of a car at 85 miles an hour on a rutted logging road with trees reaching out at our door handles. So Dave, end of quote. So Dave said, it seemed like a good time to ask, quote, Muhammad, are you afraid of dying? Ali responded, you don't ever want to die. And Kindred said, glad to hear that. Ali prays at his mosque at Deer Lake. Moving forward to the Sphinx fight, Ali is rarely alone. But before dawn on the day of the New Orleans fight, Ali reads the newspaper at a house where he is staying. Let me close tonight with my favorite Ali story. There were four of us riding in a car in Louisville in Ali's old neighborhood, which was south of Broadway on a street where there are sidewalks between the street and the house. Ali decided, I'm sitting in the front seat in the passenger seat and two people are in the back. And <clears throat> Ali decides he wanted to go to make a sort of a U-turn. So he pulled into the driveway across the sidewalk and there happened to be two girls coming down and they stopped for the car. And somebody in the back seat, before he put it in reverse, said, hey girls, here's the champ, the world champ. And he leaned across me and said, and waved to them and said, hi, pretty girls. And nothing else was said. And he put it in reverse and went back the, in the direction in which he came. He then looked in the rear view mirror and looked at the person who had said what he did. And he said, don't say that again. He said, if they recognize me, fine. If they don't, that's okay too. Ali, certainly, certainly the greatest that we'll ever know. I feel sure of that. Thanks for letting me share a few icons in Kentucky with you all tonight. A first responder in Eastern Kentucky, a Kentucky State Trooper by the name of Paul Maynard, Slim Island's quiet renewal in the Ohio River, a mine disaster in, in Eastern Kentucky's coal fields, plus a well-known two-time governor seeking a third term, a legendary co coach on his home court and an iconic athlete training in the ring and a great personality outside the ring, whether or not it's Kentucky or the world, Muhammad Ali. Tonight, I've tried to bring you a bit of Kentucky's visual history, thanks to the Filson, to its staff. And uh, I give it back to you. Thank you for the Zoom Zoomers tonight. Thanks again, Patrick, it's for you. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, we'll get your, your screen down and get into some questions here. Just for everybody, um, thank you all for, again, for sticking with us through the, the, the technical difficulties. We are gonna get a fresh recording out to everybody who 
uh, signed up for this without all the, the technical delays and things. So look forward to that. But in the meantime, let's do some questions. Um, if anybody has any, please drop them into the chat and, and we've got a few minutes to, uh, to, to answer these. I, yeah, uh, thanks and, and, and are, are rolling in through the chat, Tom, uh, for everybody for sharing these really wonderful um, photos. I wonder if you could start off by talking a little bit about for our listeners who might not remember the Sunday Magazine. What was that? What was that like? Um, and what opportunities did that that give that the the normal paper didn't? Um, for, for well, first of all, it was color, and um, the, uh, color provided the only in the magazine was the only place in the newspaper or newspapers around the country uh, for either editorial work, stories, photographs, but also advertising. There was something. Uh, called the locally edited magazines. There were 23 of them. We were all printed at Standard Gravier, which was next door and owned by the Bingham companies. All those magazines were edited in their respective cities, whether it was Dallas or Miami or Houston or New Orleans or Cincinnati or Indianapolis and so on. And so it provided a real, a, a real opportunity for color to get into the newspaper. It was very popular during the war and after the war, uh, when Harold Davis, uh, H. Harold Davis was the chief color photographer and Sissy Gregg produced those wonderful um, recipes and, and food every week, highly thought of, along with Kentucky uh, editorial and uh, cultural stories every week. So weekly it came out and uh, it was a place for color. Yeah, I remember uh, I've used some of those in my research and it really is this wonderful opportunity to, to dive deeply into a subject and Rich, it, they, they make a fantastic um, you know, uh, resource for, for historians. I'm really glad we've got them. I'm glad um, I worked on something that you researched on. <laughs> I've used earlier ones now. Care, careful, on. careful, careful, careful. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, about photographing Happy Chandler. We saw some of your photos from the end of his career. I wonder if you could talk about some of the, the earlier photos that you took of him. Well, it started when I was a senior in college. Uh, I took my spring vacation. Uh, the Democratic primary was going on. This was 19, I should go 63, but uh, it was 1963. And, uh, it was, he ran against Ned Breathitt, for, again, as I mentioned earlier, for the Democratic nomination. So I spent four of days with uh, Breathitt in uh, Louisville, and then uh, four more days in uh, Eastern Kentucky with Happy Chandler. And from that, uh, that was the last days from Eastern Kentucky. That was really the last days, as I've said earlier, uh, of the courthouse meetings, usually at noon, not meetings, but uh, uh, rallies. And uh, it was, uh, they usually operated at, uh, occurred, if you will, at noon and at seven o'clock. But those are the last days of those. They continued a little bit, but, uh, and then uh, after that was over, I freelanced the uh, results to the picture pages for consecutive days to the Louisville Times and another set of pictures to uh, Saturday Evening Post magazine. Well, we've heard a little bit about, uh, about college now. We've got one question from the audience. Where did you learn photography? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate to work in high school with a, uh, a very creative uh, studio guy, uh, Leroy Anderson. Uh, he had a studio, sort of a one-man band, but very creative. He also had a, he established a color uh, laboratory for the working professionals in town and around and uh, processing transparencies and uh, print making prints as well. But uh, I, I worked there and then I worked uh, freelance for a publication in St. Matthews called The Voice of St. Matthews, and I shot a lot around high school, had a home dark room. Uh, sort of like it's the same story that everybody has. And I went to college at a place that didn't know what photojournalism was, and that's okay, uh, because I got a good liberal arts education. And 
then I just kept on uh, trying and went to workshops in high in college and uh, uh, just had to see if I could make it, frankly, and I applied for an internship at the Courier Journal for the, as I said earlier, a summer replacement, we were called summer replacements. And I just had to see if I could make it as a photographer. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more in depth about uh, those photos of the hide and mine disaster. Um, what were some of the, the the challenges that you faced in in shooting that? Well, it's always difficult to photograph a tragedy or where people are under duress or in a situation where, excuse me, where uh, you know it's negative for them. Uh, at the hide and mine disaster. Uh, it happened, uh, you know, that story uh, happened in about three days. It was December of 1970, as I said, the turn of the year. And uh, I had, uh, I never went into Eastern Kentucky in those days without a reservation because there were very few motel rooms in Eastern Kentucky in those days. So I made a reservation at the, at the Citadel, which is up on top of a mountain very well-known place. And it rained, it rained. It snowed 12 inches during that day, overnight. And by the time I was ready to go up to the hotel, which was like two o'clock in the morning, because I had helped some of the daily photographers in a lab, uh, there was no way to get up that hill. So I uh, pulled into the Gulf oil station, the gas station, and put a note on the on the window that said, wake me up at six. And they did, or wake me up who the first person come in. So they did. But then during the next day, well, the, the site in the church where the man comes in with the list, I put all my gear down and gave it to somebody else and went in with one camera, very, very quietly, sat down and waited and waited and waited. And there was a moment where he came in and asked for a particular miner's family and the room kind of fell apart. And I made two or three frames, pictures, and then got up and walked away. And then the funeral started to happen. And there were several funerals where people welcomed us, welcomed me personally because they wanted a recognition of their guy's sacrifice. There was one, the last picture of the, being the, of the casket being carried up the side of the hill to the hilltop cemetery. And, the, some, and we were out by the road and a family member or a person acting on behalf of the family came up to me and said, the family wishes that you would not come down next where the casket is. I said, absolutely fine, no problem. So I stood up on this thing and here comes, here they start a few minutes later, they carry the casket down the little pathway and started back up again. And there's another little pathway on the left. Whoa, there's the picture. Oh, there is the picture. And I would have never gotten that had not the family said, we'd like not for you to come down and photograph near the casket, near the family. So that's a, that's the challenge is to is to be careful of people and their senses and their fragile their fragility during a very tough situation. That's the challenge. Absolutely. Um, we had a really excellent question and, and you were really gracious to, to talk about some of your colleagues um, and someone asked, what are your top three photographers that you've worked with. Oh boy, how about digging me a hole. <laughs> um, I wouldn't even dare come close to that because I was fortunate to be working among uh, several dozen really, really good photographers. And we were able to recruit uh, a number of really fine, fine people, people who went on to national magazines and uh, top photo jobs. Uh, and directors of photography and so on, I've been and, and photo editors of note. 
I, we were just so pleased to be able to to uh, work with those people. There's no way I could I could knock it to three people because uh, we had such a great uh, staff, and and I was so pleased. I've always been proud of them, and uh, whether I was a shooter or uh, as I like to say sometimes a bureaucrat, a director of photography. We've got a, a couple more really excellent questions and I wanna, I wanna take time for all of them because they're really good. Um, what was the, the most dangerous situation personally for you um, that you were in while shooting photos? Oh, I don't know. I don't know that I ever felt real danger. Um, I photographed time trials at the uh, Indy 500. And there, in those days, there was a little wall uh, between the grass, uh, between the grass and the track at the finish line, essentially, well, it's at the finish line. And um, so the cars are whizzing by. And I stood up on the wall, which is the wall was probably two feet high, because I wanted to get a good angle on the last bit of brick that went all the way across the track. Winners, including Helio uh, Castanevas this year leans down and kisses the brick. Everybody kisses the brick. And I wanted the car in the foreground going by in a blur. And I wanted the sharp brick. Got the picture, but if that car had veered off, I wouldn't have gotten the picture. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think that is a really perceptive question as well. Uh, watching recent political campaigns, we see photographers um, restricted and roped off and, and sort of cordoned off and, and dealing with handlers. Do you feel like you would have had as much access um, as you had during your career if you had been working today? Uh, in general, no. Uh, starting with the president, uh, the, the president has a tight, what they call a tight pool, uh, and that's the traveling people. I'm talking photo now. They have a tight pool and they'll add a local person to that, usually. We often had a person, his name was Bill Luster, um, who was in the tight pool with a visiting president. And of course, he, he photographed uh, six or seven or eight or so presidents behind the scenes, uh, like no other newspaper, short of the Washington Post or the New York Times, uh, got, we got access. Uh, then they have the general press, uh, which is usually uh, back behind the first the first level of crowd, but it's it's an entirely different thing today. And I think, and the more local you get, the more uh, access you can get, um, and especially uh, earlier in the in a particular campaign. For example, uh, going to Iowa in the presidential uh, primaries or other states as well, whether it's New Hampshire or any of the others, uh, it's pretty open season there. It's, the access is quite good. Now, as you get closer to the election, more people show up and the access is, is cut down quite a bit. But uh, there are times when there is great access. That's a really fantastic thought. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up for tonight, but I would like to read one comment from the, the chat, which I think sums up my thoughts and, and everybody who's watching. Um, uh, so I love hearing the stories about these iconic pictures that, that I'd never heard. Your pictures are part of the visual history of Kentucky and will be treasured for hundreds of years to come. Tom Harden, thank you so much for being with us tonight.